I wish to thank the faculty and administration of Beeson Divinity School and Dr. Matthew Burford of Tactical Faith for the great honor of being invited to speak to you all at this, the 28th Annual Biblical Studies Lectures. I've had a high regard for Beeson for many years, although this is my first time to visit here. Not only is this a superb theological institute, and not only is it situated on the campus of one of the best universities in the South, but the balance and the depth of the faculty and your unwavering commitment to the evangelical faith are both praiseworthy and rare. This is my first visit to your school. To speak in Hodge's Chapel is a unique treat. To bring glory to God with art and architecture, to mold a place of worship whose aesthetics are rich and meaningful is hardly something that Protestants are known for. And as far as this podium is concerned, I'm just glad that John Chrysostom, Jan Hus, John Knox, and George Whitfield are looking out rather than at me when I speak to you today. <laughs> In the last 15 years, I've logged thousands of hours examining and photographing ancient manuscripts of the New Testament. One of the things that has profoundly struck me is the exquisite beauty and craftsmanship of these codices. These scribes understood well that aesthetics were an important part of worship, that we must love God both with our left brain and with our right brain. And just as Beeson's motto uh, exclaims, so also these scribes displayed with their craft, soli deo gloria. Some of you may know that I was initially invited, and uh, Grant mentioned this already this morning, to give the 27th Biblical Studies lectures last year. But as 2016 was winding down, it was becoming obvious that my mother would soon pass from this life to the next. She was 87 years old. My wife and I had flown from Dallas to Seattle to visit my parents uh, in December of 2016. And we even, we even played table games, which was a favorite thing for my mom to do. She was still quite coherent. And then, uh, as was our usual custom, whenever we would get together, mom wanted to talk theology with me. Our conversations used to last many, many hours into the evening, but her health, her health was in such decline that we treasured these moments because they were so few and far between now, reflecting on God's greatness and His grace. When the new year arrived, 2017, we all knew that Mom would soon die. I had to bow out of the lectureship in light of her imminent homegoing. Mom went to be with her Lord and King on January 30th, 2017. The next month, I gave the eulogy at the memorial service. Remarkably, Ben Witherington was ready and willing to take my place on virtually a moment's notice for this lectureship. It is to his great credit that he could actually put together significant lectures on the Bible so quickly. But then again, he is Ben Witherington. I'm grateful to Ben and to the syndics of Beeson Divinity School for your flexibility and mercy. Today, I have been asked to speak on Psalm 2, one of the great messianic passages of the Old Testament. The title of my message is The Rebellion of the Nations and the Reign of the Son. My objective is to get a bird's eye view of the psalm. We will note its structure, read the text once again, and touch briefly on some of the exegetical, historical, and translational issues. But intermingled with all this, we'll also see the usage of this psalm on a trajectory reaching right up to the New Testament. And finally, we will offer some applications for us today. The second psalm is comprised of 12 verses, artistically arranged in four strophes. Each strophe is three verses long. We might say that different dialogue partners are in view in each group, although dialogue is a bit of an overstatement. Still, to see different speakers ad uh, addressing different individuals may help us to get a handle on this text. In the first strophe, verses 1 through 3, we see an international conspiracy, if you will, as the leaders of the world plot against Yahweh and His anointed one. In the second, verses 4 through 6, the Lord of heaven speaks to these earthly monarchs, announcing the establishment 
of his king, which terrifies the world rulers. The third strophe, verses 7 through 9, has Yahweh speaking to his son, giving him the promise of a future universal reign. Finally, in verses 10 through 12, the psalmist speaks to these foolish and rebellious kings, offering them sage advice to serve the Lord and submit to his son, or else certain destruction awaits them. As my first Hebrew professor, Alan Ross, I suspect he's a name you may know, uh, notes in his commentary on the Psalms, Psalm 2 is a royal psalm which could be sung by the choirs at any appropriate time, certainly at coronations of kings, but also in times of national crises. After the Babylonian captivity, when the nation had no king, all they could cling to was hope. While Israel was being ravaged successively by the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans, they turned their focus more and more to their ultimate king, the final anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And so a third period arises for interpreting the psalm, the hundreds and hundreds of years when there was no king sitting on the throne of David. The longing of the nation for this eternal Messiah, its ever reigning monarch, was uh, acute at this time. And there are clues here and there in this psalm that just such a king was prophesied, as we will see. In the first trophy, we read about the nations raging and plotting, verses 1 through 3. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The psalmist begins with a rhetorical question, why do the nations rage? He hints at the likelihood of their success when he speaks of them plotting in vain. The word for plot is the same verb that is used in Psalm 1-2 that is translated meditate. And the contrast between the riches and the wicked is seen in these thoughts that become vocalized. The righteous person meditates on the law of God. The wicked plots against the same God. Ironically, God fills the thoughts and words of both the righteous and the wicked. But what they think and say about him are polar opposites. The same is true today. In verse 2, we see the nations of the world plotting against Yahweh and his anointed. They take counsel together. The foolishness of their conspiring is only matched by the stunning achievement of their unity. In the New Testament, we read of the Pharisees and Sadducees, joined together in Greek by a single article, so as to render them united in some sense. But the Pharisees and Sadducees historically were never united on anything. There was one thing and one thing only that could bring them together, their opposition to Jesus Christ. In fact, every time that Matthew speaks of the Pharisees and Sadducees, he uses this construction to emphasize their united front as enemies of the gospel and of God's anointed king. Shortly after Pentecost, the apostolic church saw Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2 coming to fulfillment. In Acts 4, verses 25 through 27, after Peter and John had been interrogated by the Sanhedrin, the church quoted these two verses and applied them to the Lord Jesus. And they added in their prayer, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The apostles recognized that even though the nations rage, all they can do is whatever God's hand and God's plan had predestined to take place. As bleak as things may look at times, everything is under God's control. And faith is not tested when all is well. Now, the Hebrew word Mashiach is an adjective from which we get the word Messiah. It's the word translated anointed. Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with oil uh, when they were officially installed in their office. Predominantly, Mashiach was used of the anointing of a king in the Old Testament. The Septuagint almost always translates it by the Greek word Christos, 
We get our word Christ, of course, from this. And by the time the New Testament was written, Christos is no longer an adjective. It has evolved into a noun, keeping pace with the history of Israel and the saga of redemption. After the Babylonian exile, the nation was no longer looking for just an anointed one. They were looking for the anointed one, the Christ. In the New Testament, when the gospel spread to Gentile regions, Christos, or Christ, was frequently viewed just as Jesus' last name. And so in this psalm, beginning in verse 2, I think we get a glimpse of how its interpretation will both expand and narrow through the unfolding drama of redemption. It will expand by incorporating the whole world, and it will narrow by having in mind David's greater son. In this passage, Yahweh so associates himself with his anointed one that those who rebel against the Mashiach are those who rebel against God himself. The Lord Jesus grasps this theme when he proclaims that all must honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. No wonder Jesus would later declare, I and the Father are one. Ultimately, if we disrespect Jesus Christ, we disrespect God. There are not many ways to heaven. There is one through Jesus Christ himself. If we worship Jesus Christ, we are worshiping God. The shackles that the early uh, sovereigns in verse 3 envision are oppressive and degrading. They're, of course, not physical chains. They are the gracious rule of God to which all people must submit. The the Hebrew word cords used here is the same word we see in Hosea 11.4, where Yahweh speaks of wooing his own people. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them and fed them. What we see in Hosea and the Psalms are in reality the same. They are the same chords, the same bands. For those who love God, they are, as the hymnist said, the tie that binds. They are the unity of the Spirit of God that the Apostle Paul says we are to maintain in the bond of peace. But to the rebellious, they are the fetters of the tyrannical rule of a cosmic killjoy. In C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, we see some of the residents of hell on a bus ride going to heaven. But as they depart the bus, the majestic beauty of God's kingdom becomes for them more painful than Hades itself. The grass cuts like glass. A single leaf is a weight too great to bear. The place is more painful than they could have imagined. In the end, because these people's nature had not changed, because their hearts were not renewed because they were still rebels. They were unsuited for the divine mansions. As long as people rebel against God, as long as they reject his anointed one, they will always view God's cords of kindness as the fetters of a tyrant. All of life ultimately depends on our view, all of life ultimately depends on our view of Jesus Christ, the Lord's anointed. If we put our trust in him, willingly submit to him, and truly love him, we will rejoice over his easy yoke. But if we rebel, that same gracious yoke will become a chain, a heavy weight, an oppressive rule that we cannot bear. In the second strophe, the Lord laughs from heaven. wasn't sure where that water was hiding. (laughs) He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The kings of the earth, in verse 2, are now contrasted with the Lord who sits enthroned in the heavens. This is hardly meant to suggest God's distance from us or his lack of concern for lives of mortal man. 
We do not serve the God of deism. We do not serve a Gnostic deity. We do not worship the God who is not there. Immediately, we see that God is involved in the affairs of humanity, for he has set his king on Zion to reign over both the nation and the nations. God's locale speaks of his transcendence over us, not his distance from us. Psalm 2-4 is one of the few places in the Bible in which God laughs. It's not a pleasant picture, not one that we're used to seeing of our God. But God laughs at the rebellious nations to show that their puny threats are just plain silly. They have zero chance of success against the creator of the universe. And yet, even today, the nations rage. And what do they rage against? What is it in our world that is viewed as the incarnation of evil itself? Intolerance. Rules. A biblical worldview that exalts God and esteems Jesus Christ, that prescribes true worship only for the Godhead. The greatest good in the postmodern world has become freedom. Freedom from consequences. Freedom from conscience. Freedom from human dignity. Freedom for any and all moral choices. To reason against such a posture, to even hint at natural consequences, is to be intolerant and judgmental. And that cannot be allowed in our culture. Christians continue to be persecuted. In some parts of the world, they continue to be beheaded. They continue to be treated as outliers, continue to be marginalized by society. The new atheists are even calling believers evil. In this country, we've seen laws passed that would make the Roman Senate blush. We've become a post-Christian nation. Not that we were ever truly a Christian nation. As corrupt as ancient Rome was, same-sex marriage was something that only Caesars like the nut job Nero ever practiced. And today, more than 50 million legal abortions have been committed in this country. Well over 50 million. All in the name of tolerance and freedom. Yet, when Yahweh speaks the words that terrify these rebellious nations, what he says is not what we expect. He does not say that he will destroy the nations. He won't even punish them. Instead, he installs his anointed one as king, reigning from Zion. There seems to be a subtle shift here in the psalm. Instead of Yahweh taking vengeance on the unrepentant people, that task now belongs to the king. I think the most satisfactory way to read this psalm is what a good friend of mine calls the Emmaus Road hermeneutic. It is a rubric in which we understand that Scripture is not properly understood until it ultimately points to Jesus Christ. Of course, this Christocentric hermeneutic can be overdone, but that is hardly the case for the second psalm. And here, God does not judge the wicked, but he hands the judgment over to his king, his Messiah. It is this one who will reign eternally, who has been given all judgment from his Father. Jesus says so much in John chapter 5, verse 22. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Psalm 2 must have been on Jesus' mind a lot as he was growing up, and he explicated it on more than one occasion. In the third strophe, the Lord speaks to his Son, verses 7 through 9, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my Son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Psalm 2-7 is one of the most quoted Old Testament verses in the New Testament. It is quoted or alluded to at least half a dozen times. The whole psalm is clearly in the minds of the authors at least 19 times, more than just about any other Old Testament passage in the New Testament. 
At least that 19 is what the Nestle All in 28th Appendix says. I think probably Psalm 2 is in the minds of the authors and forms the theology of the New Testament authors' writings dozens and dozens of times. But what does it mean? In its original setting, for the Lord to say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, meant that today is the king's coronation. It was the day that the man became king. This verse is proclaimed at Jesus' baptism. It's alluded to at his transfiguration. It's affirmed at his ascension and declared at his resurrection. Since Jesus was already God's son, each of these events was an announcement rather than a speech act. The declaration did not make Jesus God's son, rather it revealed him to be so. And we see in verse 9 that the son is given judgment over all the nations. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Dashing in pieces like a potter's vessel is a simile that as some scholars have noted, but here I am quoting Dr. Ross, may be based on the Egyptian custom in which the name of each city under the king's dominion was written on a little votive jar and placed in the temple of his God. Then if the people in a city rebelled, the Pharaoh could smash that city's little jar in the presence of the deity. Such a symbolic act would terrify the rebellious and it would forebode things to come. This is preeminently, however, a vision of the eschaton, and it speaks of the great victory of the Pantocrator, the Lamb who will destroy his enemies, and as the Apostle Paul says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Finally, we come to the fourth strophe. The psalm, psalmist warns the rebellious rulers, verses 10 through 12. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. The psalmist actually concludes with a gracious warning to these rebellious rulers without denying anything about the rebellion. Serve the Lord before it is too late. In verse 12, there is a textual variant to kiss the sun. Many modern translations have do homage in purity or the like. And this is based on the fact that the Hebrew word for sun is not used here. It is not ben, but bar. That's the Aramaic word for sun. What in the world is an Aramaic word doing sitting here among the Hebrews in the second psalm? Ancient and modern translators recognizing the difficulty have amended the text to get rid of this Aramaic stranger in their midst. The Net Bible has, give sincere homage. The New American Standard says, give homage to the Son, probably combining both readings somehow. The REB and HCSB are similar. But some scholars have suggested that there may be some subtle literary flair going on with this word. The address in verse 12, in this last strophe, is to Gentile kings those who spoke Aramaic, the lingua franca of the world at the time, rather than Hebrew. Further, we see King Lemuel, presumably a foreign king, address his son with Aramaic, the word bar, twice in Proverbs 31.2. In any event, whether the word is kiss or do homage, the son is at least implicitly elevated above the kings of the earth as the king of kings. Now, I didn't intentionally skip verse 11. I wanted to end this message focusing on that verse. The wording here may strike you as a bit odd. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Aren't these antithetical ideas? Can we really rejoice? Can we really worship? Can we really enjoy God forever if we fear Him, if we tremble in His presence? Gen Xers and millennials especially have difficulty with this concept. One of the great temptations for this generation is to see Jesus Christ only as imminent, not also as transcendent. To put it bluntly, 
one of the great dangers facing the Western church of the 20th, 21st century, which could spell its destruction if it were not for the sovereign God. One of these great dangers is the buddyization of Jesus Christ. Yes, he is my friend, but he is also my sovereign. I think that C.S. Lewis captured this tension well in the Chronicles of Narnia. In this first book, children from our world are unwittingly transported into another world, another dimension. They are in Narnia where they learn from some talking animals about one called Aslan. And if you haven't been in a coma for the last 50 years, then you know that Aslan represents Jesus Christ. <laughs> As they're having tea with Mr. and Mr. Beaver in their home, they get the revelation that Aslan is a lion. So they inquire, is he, is he quite safe? I shall rather feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If anyone's there who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, thundered Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. In conclusion, Psalm 2, a royal psalm, a coronation psalm in the unfolding drama of redemption is ultimately a messianic psalm and ultimately God will win. The Messiah will reign. The wicked forces of the world will be smashed with a rod of iron. Jesus Christ will have the victory. And, the, and one of the great hymns sung by the early church known as the Kenosis will finally be fulfilled. The conclusion to this Carmen Christi, this hymn to Christ proclaims God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the end, every knee will bow to Christ. Every sentient creature will kiss the Son. But whether we do so joyfully or despairingly depends on how we respond to him in this life. And you and I have the sacred duty to warn the nations with conviction and with grace. After all, he isn't safe but he's good.